recording this computer. No worries, start recording now. Um, yeah, so I just want to also flag the UK Reproducibility Network, uh, which is a peer-led consortium across the UK institutions that help promote robust research, providing training and disseminating best practice. So if you'd like to get involved in any open research activities in any form, um, for example, helping to uh, organize the Riots Club or joining the Re UK Reproducibility Network, please get in touch with Hugo or I. So on to our talk today. Uh, Tracy is a meta researcher at the BIH Quest Center for Re Responsible Research. Her research focuses on improving data visualization, statistical reporting, open methods, and other factors that affect transparency and reproducibility. So her team's work on bar graphs of continuous data has led to policy changes in many journals that encourage authors to replace bar graphs with more inf informative graphics. Her team also designs automated screening tools to help authors improve their papers. Today, she's going to give us a talk about tips for improving the interpretability and accessibility of data visualization. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, please post them in the chat. If you have anything that you'd like to be addressed immediately, please use the raised hand function. Um, and there, there'll be kind of breaks during the talk, um, three breaks, so we can use them as like times for discussion, um, or you can just wait until the end. So without further ado, over to you, Tracy. Thank you, um, and thank you for organizing this session and inviting me to speak and to everyone for taking the time to join today and think a little bit about data visualization. So uh, as Robbie mentioned, today we'll be talking about tips to improve interpretability and accessibility, also some things related to reproducibility of your figures. So I'm going to focus on three different topics today. Um, if we don't get all through all three, that's fine with me. If people have questions and we're having an active discussion, that's perfectly okay. So the first topic is gonna to be general tips and tricks for making many different kinds of figures accessible to a broad audience. We'll then talk about how to identify and fix some common visualization problems. And if we have time for the last topic, then we'll talk a little bit about image-based figures, which would include microscopy, electron microscopy, photographs, and things like that. Okay, um, so it was mentioned in the introduction that a lot of my visualization work has focused on the inappropriate use of bar graphs to display continuous data. And unfortunately, that is not one of the topics that I will be covering today. Um, however, this is a really big issue in many fields. This is some data from a preprint that we posted last week. And you can see that across a lot of different fields in the biological sciences and the biomedical sciences, the red lines, which show bar graphs of continuous data, um, are more common than the blue lines, which show correctly used bar graphs of cancer proportions. So for most data fields, this is the most common visualization problem. And odds are, if you're looking at a bar graph, it probably should not be a bar graph. It should probably be a dot plot or a violin plot or a box plot that gives more information about the data distribution. So I won't have time to talk about this today, um, but if you'd like more information, I do have lots of resources available for this in other places. So on my Twitter account, my twin pinned tweet is a Q&A that goes through everything you ever wanted to know about why you shouldn't use a bar graph for continuous data, what to use instead, and how to find free resources to help you make better graphs. Um, there's also a life as well as our 2015 and 2019 papers that have a lot of visualizations as well. Okay, so let's move into the broader topic of visualization now. So data presentation um, is really important and I think as, as Robbie mentioned, this series is going to focus on a lot of topics that are potentially relevant for reproducibility, for transparency, for the rigor of your scientific ex experiments. And so I think it's worth spending a minute just thinking about why data visualization and data presentation is so important and why this should be on the list of things that we're thinking about as we're thinking about how to make our science more transparent and reproducible. 
And the thing I'd like to highlight here is that data presentation is really the foundation of our collective scientific knowledge. So when we design our papers, we use figures to show the most important findings, the things that we really want people to understand and to remember about what we learned from our experiments. And most of the time, the raw data underlying those figures aren't available. And so all that we will ever know about that data set is limited to what the authors have chosen to show us. And if authors are consistently making poor choices about the types of visualizations they use or the way that those visualizations are designed, then we are interfering with others' ability to understand our data sets, not only now, but for all of the future. And no one wants to be responsible for ruining the future. So it's really important to think carefully about your data visualizations. There are two common but incorrect assumptions that people tend to make when they're designing figures. Um, the first is that readers read the paper in the order that it was meant to be read. So by the time they get to figures, they have already seen the abstract in the introduction and the methods. And a lot of times, this is not true. The second thing that we tend to assume is that if we can interpret the figure as the author, then our readers can also interpret the figure. And this is also, most of the time, not true. So let's talk about these two assumptions. We know from anecdotal reports that many readers look at the figures first. So there are a lot of scientists, reviewers, and editors who say that when they get a new paper or a preprint that they're examining, they go straight to the figures. That's the first thing they want to see. And based on the figures, they make decisions about whether they want to go ahead and read the rest of the paper. And we know that both search engines and journal websites cater to this interest of authors by allowing readers to examine the figures along with the title and abstract. So if you go into a search engine like PubMed, you see the title and the abstract, and then you can scroll through the figures to get a sense of what data are shown in the paper. And then we also know that scientists are sharing a lot of figures on their posters and in talks and in social media. And all of these places are places where authors are going to see your figures without necessarily seeing the abstract, the introduction, and the results. So we need to be very strategic about how we design figures so that they stand on their own and they convey a clear message for someone who hasn't seen all of these other sections of our paper first. We want to design figures for a broad audience. So we often assume that our readers are people just like us, that they come from the same field as us, that they know the same techniques within our field, and that they see things and understand things the way that we see things. And this is often not true. And it's to our benefit that this is not true because we want our readers and our work to impact a wide variety of scientists across different fields, across different methods, across different techniques. And so for most papers, readers are going to include scientists in your field, but they may also include scientists in related fields, scientists that are in your field, but use different methods or different approaches from the ones that you use reviewers and editors who may or may not share your scientific background and focus. They might also include patients, educators, and grants officers that work with funding agencies. And these people can come from a very wide range of training backgrounds um, and expertise levels. And so things that are very clear to you may be, confusing, may be quite confusing to a reader who has a different expertise. So the first rule of designing figures is that you want to design figures for your audience, not for yourself. And remember that audience is very broad. And that means that your figures should be self-exclamatory. They should be easy for people with a range of various different levels of expertise and types of expertise to interpret. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples to think about how this might work in practice. So I have here an electron microscopy image. Now, maybe one or two of you might be able to look at this and recognize that in fact, this is a micro electron microscopy image of a mouse pancreatic beta islet cell. Most of you probably have no idea what this is and wouldn't know how to interpret it or what exactly the figure was shown if you saw it in the paper. And so this raises the question of what level of annotation do we need to help our readers understand the figure and interpret how it fits in with our answer to the question that we are asking in our research. <laughs> 
So in the first panel here, we have no annotation. Probably this figure is not very useful to anyone. No one knows what's going on here unless they happen to be an expert in this particular technique, which is not good for catering to a broad audience. In our next panel, we have some annotation. So we have labeled the section where the peripheral insulin secretory vesicles are shown. We have some labels illustrating where the mitochondria are, where the nucleus is, and where the cytoplasm is. And this helps orient us to some of the features that are shown in this particular image and what it is that we're looking at and how it is that it might relate to our research question. In the next panel, we have all of the labels, so many labels that in fact, it's hard to see the labels and it's also hard because the labels are covering up and interfering with our ability to interpret the image. And furthermore, we have this huge legend of text below that is supposed to help us guide, these, guide us through these labels and interpret what they mean, but in reality, isn't very helpful at all. So this is too much annotation and not well done. However, there are times when you may need this level of annotation in order to help others interpret your figure. So what do you do in this case? Well, one option is to use the image as its own legend. So we place an annotated image next to the original and that annotated image becomes the legend for the original image. And this, we're going to do our, our labeling on a semi-transparent white background so that the features of the image are visible, but the labels still stand out and are easy for us to see. And then we're going to replace that giant mess of text at the bottom that was really hard to interpret with shapes and symbols to make it easily to visually match what it is that we're seeing in the legend with what it is in terms of the legend entry telling us what these things represent. And so this allows us to clearly see the image, also identify key features quickly and determine what it is that those features represent by looking at the legend listed below and map those things back to what it is that we're seeing on the image itself. Here's another example of how to rethink your visualization and consider how to make it accessible for a broad audience. We're going to use a graph this time that shows odds ratios. And there is one caveat. Um, I'm using this visualization because it's a very nice illustration of how to make your figure or your graph easy for others to interpret. However, it uses a linear scale to show odds ratios and odds ratios should really pre be presented on a log scale. So that is one limitation of this particular image that I'd like you to be aware of before I show it. Okay, so this is a figure that I found in a paper, um, not a special paper, just any paper that shows odds ratios. For those of you who work in fields where odds ratios are commonly used, you might be very comfortable with this and you might know exactly what it's showing. Those of you who don't work with odds ratios or aren't very familiar with them or don't see them often might be quite confused. You might be confused about why the line is at one instead of at zero, what exactly these numbers represent and what it really means about um, the different groups that are shown here. What information is this graph really giving us? So let's look at a way of potentially redesigning a figure for odds ratios to make it easier for a broad audience to interpret. So here we have the annotated image above highlighting some features that were used to make the labeling easier and then a clean version of the same graph below to allow you to interpret it as a whole. So the first thing is that we have labeled what the comparison group is. Um, and so the comparison group is white and then we can see that we have other racial and ethnic groups listed along the sides for our comparators. We have also noted that anything to the right of this line is representing an increased risk of dying from COVID-19. And the graph then at the bottom indicates that the show is showing the likelihood of dying from COVID-19 compared to white ethnicity. Instead of simply listing the numbers for the odds ratio, we've changed those to what they mean. So just as likely, one and a half times as likely, two times as likely to give us an indicator of what those ratios are representing. And then the combination of all these things makes it much easier to understand for an, a reader who's not familiar with odds ratios, what exactly it is that this figure is showing and how to interpret the information contained within.
One of the things that we tend to think about when we're visualizing data is that the lessons that we're learning only apply to figures. In fact, there are also things that you can do when you're making tables in order to make them visually informative. So here I have a table that was in our recent preprint, and it shows the number of papers in our sample for each year from 10, 2010 to 2020 for a variety of different fields, 23 different fields to be exact that we look at. And our goal was to get to 1,000 papers sampled from PubMed Central, but this wasn't always possible because in some cases with smaller fields, they simply didn't have that many papers for some of the years that we were looking at. So I could just show you this table as a, as, a, as a standard table with no color and a lot of numbers, but it would take you a very long time to figure out what's going on. It would probably annoy you and probably you would not wanna spend the time doing all of that. So what I did instead was I provided a colored legend. And so our goal was to identify a thousand papers whenever we could. Um, and you can see that dark blue represents places where we were pretty close to a thousand. And then as we go towards lighter shades of blue and then light green, you can see we're further and further away from our sample numbers. These colors as a human reader make it much easier for me to see the overall message of this table. And that message is that in most cases, we were pretty close to getting a thousand papers. However, in some of the smaller fields, particularly in the first three to four years of the data set, we had trouble reaching those targets. And this comes through much more clearly with the colors. Here is another example. So this is a table from a meta-analysis that's showing inclusion and exclusion criteria. And I could have written in black, included and excluded, or yes and no in every box. Um, but instead we have symbols. So an X for an exclusion criteria, or you know, this, this was an exclusion from the study or a check mark indicating that people were included. And the combination of the symbols and the colors makes it much easier for people to quickly see where the inclusions and exclusions were and how many things were included versus excluded in this particular set of studies that we're looking at. And that probably wouldn't come through if everything had been done through text and in black. So this is another example of a way that you can adjust your tables to make them easier for someone to understand. There are a couple of cautions here. If you are color coding, you want to remember that the color coding is not machine readable. It is simply intended to help a human reader to see overall patterns. One of the things that you don't want to do when you're color coding a table is to interfere with the machine readability. So under no circumstances should you convert that table to a figure because then it's no longer useful as a table and someone can no longer get the data out of it. And you also want to leave the numbers in there so that people have the actual numbers that they would need to do follow-up analyses. The visualization and the colors are simply a layer on top that makes it easier for a human reader to quickly get the message about what's going on. I also showed an example with yes, no, and using check marks and X's and different colors and different symbols for each answer. Um, you may also have a maybe or unclear option, in which case you might use a question mark in a different color to allow readers to quickly visually see that piece. Okay, so the next thing to think about when you are designing your figures is that when I'm writing a paper, I always like to start by identifying the most technically challenging concepts for my audience and then creating visualizations to explain those concepts. One visualization that's nicely done is much easier and more pleasant to interpret than two to three paragraphs of text, which might be quite long, very detailed, very boring, and not as effective or efficient in conveying your message. So when you're designing a figure, there are three steps that you want to follow. The first thing you're going to do is to define the objective of your figure. And if you are making a database figure, then all elements in your figure should be related to a single research question. This isn't always something that we can follow because of the limits on the number of figures in journals, but whenever you can do this, you should try to make sure that everything in a figure is related to a single research question. The next step is to organize and plan your figures using a figure planning table. And then the third thing is to organize your panels using a figure layout sketch. And I'll show you what this looks like. 
Okay, so the first thing is to define our figure objective. So let's say we decide that the objective is the figure is to illustrate the effects of an animal model and an experimental treatment on pup and placental phenotype. My next thing would be to go to a figure planning table. And so here I'm going to outline criteria for each panel. And here I have three panels, A, B, and C. I'm going to list the objective for each panel, the visualizations that I want to include, the experimental groups, and then notes or things to keep in mind as I prepare the visualizations for my figure. So my first panel, the objective is going to be illustrate the differences in the phenotype of the pups. And I know I want to have a photograph of the pups as well as a graph showing data. And I'm going to have four different groups, a control group with placebo, an experimental group with placebo, a control group that received a treatment, and an experimental group that received the treatment. My notes are that in the photograph, I need to make sure that I have a ruler as a scale bar, and the chart is going to be a box plot showing weight. My second panel is going to illustrate the differences in the placental phenotype. Here again, I will have a photograph of the placentas and a chart. I'll have the same groups as in my previous uh, panel. And I have the same notes and comments as for the previous panel. With the third panel, I want to illustrate histological differences in placenta. For example, I might show staining for two different markers. Here, I'm going to have some microscopy images for a placenta for each marker, same groups as before. And then I want one image per group and a separate panel for each bio or a separate row or column for each biomarker. Okay, now that we've completed our figure planning table, we can go towards making a layout sketch. So generally speaking, when we read, our eyes go from left to right and from top to bottom. And so this means we either want to choose a layout in rows so that we can naturally go from left to right and then top to bottom or a layout in columns where we go from top to bottom and then from left to right. And we always want to use white space in between our different panels to help guide the eye as to where the panels are um, to break things up a little bit. And so we can see which collection of things go together. And so in panel A here, I have my photograph and then my, um, my dot plot or box plot. Um, same thing in panel B. And then here for the microscopy images, I have two rows, one with each group for biomarker one, and then a second with each group for biomarker two. In the second one, things are just simply oriented in columns. So I have panel A with the photo in the dot plot, the same for panel B. And then with the microphotographs, I have them arranged in a square according to control versus model and placebo versus treatment. And once you have this, it's fairly easy to put your visualizations together and make your figure. Okay, the next thing that's important once you have your figures is learning to critique and refine your figures. So I'm going to give you an example of how I created this particular figure. And this figure is designed to address the misconception that it's still okay to use a bar graph if I know that my data are normally distributed, which is a question I get a lot. So I created this figure, to help me answer that question quickly um, without taking too much time. When I go through figures, I usually do at least four to five versions before I have something that I'm happy with, sometimes more. And so I'm going to show you what those versions look like for this figure. So when you're creating visualizations, the first thing that you want to do is start off with a clear message. If you are addressing misconceptions, as I am in this big case, then you want to target and address those things very directly. And then, as I mentioned, you're going to go through multiple versions. Never keep your first version of the figure and never publish a figure that you haven't shown to someone. You always want to test and revise your figure until it conveys a clear message and until you're getting good feedback from other people that they understand what the figure is showing quickly. And this is just a quote that I really like from a colleague of mine, Helena Yambor at the Technical University Dresden. And she said that good visualizations are designed. They don't happen by accident. So if you don't have a clear plan for what you want to figure your figure to show and how it's going to show that, then probably your figure won't accidentally end up showing all of the things you were hoping that it would communicate. Okay. So I know that I need a concept for my figure. So there are three things that I want to show in this figure. 
already, that's going to make it complicated because usually it's easier to design a figure when we only have one message. I want to show that bar graphs don't allow us to critically evaluate the data, that they distort our perception of the range of observed values, and that they draw attention to unimportant aspects of the data. So specifically, they focus our attention on the height of the bar and not how the difference in means compares to the variability in the data. The next thing I'm going to do is create a quick sketch of what a figure that shows this might look like. So I know immediately that I want to have three panels, a bar graph showing mean and standard error, a bar graph combined with a dot plot, and then a dot plot. I know I'm going to have a region at the top where there are, in fact, data points, but the axis of the bar graph is cut off because it's above the highest bar. And I know I'm going to have a region at the bottom of the graph where there are no data points. So the next thing I'm going to do is simply create that figure that I sketched out that I wanted. And so this was my first version of the figure. And the main problem here is that there is way too much going on. The eye doesn't know where to look and I can't tell what's important. So this particular figure is designed to be an infographic. It is not a data figure. Um, this could be any figure. I am simply using it to illustrate to people why you would use different types of graphs and why you need to show the data points, even if you know that your data are normally distributed. So in this case, my axis doesn't actually matter and what this variable is doesn't actually matter. Um, these are for this graph because it's an infographic and not a data graph, this is irrelevant information for the message I want to convey. So I'm going to start off by eliminating the axis labels and the scales. The only thing that I need that in this case is relevant to my message is to know that the bar graph axis starts at zero. So I'm going to leave this zero here and get rid of all of the rest of these things. So now I have a much cleaner graph, but I still have problems here. And this is because I am using color very badly. Um, so color is what's called a pre-attentive attribute. That means that there, if there is color in your figure, your brain is drawn to it, it will pay attention to it, whether you want it to or not. And so when we're using color, we want to use it to highlight places where we want the eye to look. And in this case, the color is not used in an informative way. So it's creating a flag effect and it's actually drawing the eye away from where we want to focus. And where I want the eye to focus is on the range of observed values. So I'm going to change the colors and use the color to highlight that range of observed values instead of these other parts of the graph. So this is the version where I've done that, and then I've labeled this region so I can tell what it is that the color represents, which is the range of observed values. Now, here again, I have a problem because when I removed the other bars, the graph is no longer highlighting that the bar graph is distorting the range of the observed values. So I'm not highlighting that I have this part here in the graph where there are data points, but my axis is cut off, or this part here where there are no data points. So what I can do next is to add boxes to the bar graph to highlight these regions of distortion. So now I have my boxes but I don't know why they're boxes there. They're just random boxes, which looks kind of weird. So I need to create names for these things. And so I named these things the zone of invisibility and the zone of irrelevance. This would be good if I were doing a figure for publication. If I'm doing something and sharing in a talk or social media, then I might want to add some additional information to give context and to help people interpret the figure. So I might use a title like why you shouldn't use a bar graph, even if your data are normally distributed. And then I might highlight the take home messages at the bottom, that bar graphs don't allow you to critically evaluate continuous data, and that they arbitrarily assign importance to the height of the bar instead of focusing on the amount of overlap between the groups. Okay. So I mentioned that it's really important to go through multiple versions of your figure and to test your visualizations. I will usually do visualization tests of 10 to 30 seconds, depending on how complicated the visualization is. Sometimes I will send visualizations out through my Twitter account to get a sense of how people are reacting to them. 
Other things that can be helpful in terms of reproducibility are asking a co-author to check your calculations and summary statistics or to recreate your data figures in a different software to confirm that all of your calculations are correct. And then another thing that can be very helpful is to consider depositing your visualizations in an online repository. Um, our group creates a lot of visualizations that people like to reuse for talks, for teaching, for papers, for various other purposes. And so having my visualizations available in a repository makes it really easy for others to get that data without having to contact me um, in order to ask permission to change it in a particular way. Okay, the next concept I'm going to talk about is how to use emphasis and de-emphasis to direct attention and avoid overplotting. So I'll show you two examples of this. Here are, here's the same graph shown in two different ways. In the first graph, everything is emphasized. The scale bars and the axes are black, the data points are black, the median lines are black, Everything is equally weighted and there is nothing to direct the reader's attention to any particular feature. So the reader isn't sure where to look and it would take them more time to interpret the graph. Here's an alternative version where I've used emphasis and de-emphasis. In this case, I've emphasized the median lines by showing them in black and in the foreground. And I've de-emphasized the data points and the axes by showing them in gray and in the background. And essentially what this does is it says to your reader, look here, look at the median lines. And when you do that, this high one jumps out and it's much easier to see the message that the graph is conveying. Sometimes we like to combine different types of graphs. So here we're combining a median line with a box plot with a dot plot. And when we combine lots of types of graphs together, we can have problems with what's known as overplotting or too much information. Emphasis and de-emphasis helps us with that. So here I have three levels. I have used median lines are shown in the color red. So this is the thing that will draw most attention and it's the first thing someone will see. In this first panel, I've emphasized the dot plots and by putting them in black and in the foreground. And then I've de-emphasized the box plots by putting them in gray in the background. In this graph, I've reversed this trend. The dot plots are de-emphasized. They're in gray in the background and the box plots are emphasized in black and in the foreground. So this shows you how you can use emphasis and de-emphasis to combine multiple types of figures in a way that does not overwhelm your viewer. Okay, that's all I have for this section. Um, if you want more information on this topic, then I would highly recommend a couple of things. The first is a blog post by Helene Yambor on better figures for the life sciences. It will take you two minutes to read. It provides a very good overview of the figure design process and it's worth every second of the two minutes you will spend on it. Um, this paper that I mentioned about a brief guide to designing effective figures for the scientific paper is also helpful. And then there's also a link here to a talk that I give on why you need a dissemination strategy and how to design one that works. So that is the end of this section. Did we want to pause for questions, comments, or emotional outbursts before we continue? Um, we had one question from David Colquhoun in the chat about, he said, I wonder why you say that odds ratios should be given on a log scale um, and that some people sadly seem to have problems with logarithms. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> I think Andrew Gelman has a nice post on this. Um, essentially anything that's, that is a ratio is, yeah, the, the log scale ends up being a more accurate and reflective interpretation of the underlying data. Um, the other thing is that if your, log, if your odds ratio is not on a log scale, then the error bars will end up being uneven on the two sides. So it'll be smaller on the, the low side and then longer on the high side whereas the log scale makes the um, error bars equal on both sides as well. Um, okay, great. And I, I had a quick question actually about on the much cleaned up um, picture of with the odds ratios image, mm -hmm. I noted that all of the text on the right hand side had disappeared. So the the kind of confidence interval and like the specific odds ratio itself. 
you think are there different scenarios in which you think it would would or wouldn't be important to to include or not include that information yeah so the so firstly to clarify the original image that i showed from a paper was a completely different set of odds ratios from the you know the second version that i showed that was a more visually um friendly version of odds ratios to a broad audience there are certainly scenarios for a scientific audience where it can be very helpful to include information about your odds ratios on the side of the figure so that people have the exact numbers if they want them and they're not relying on a tool like plot digitizer to help them estimate those values um, that information can also be put in the figure legend or in the text depending on how you prefer to do things thank you and i noticed that david's got his hand up Yes, on this question of odds ratios being on a log scale, I mean, it seems to me to do no harm at all to show asymmetric confidence mm -hmm. intervals. In fact, it's only an approximation that they'd be symmetrical on a log scale anyway, because Fela's theorem shows, well, sometimes that the one or other limit isn't defined at all. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's, it's, um, it's not the main point. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's it's a it's a caveat that I like to acknowledge when I'm showing the graph. Um, some people have strong feelings one way or the other, and that is fine. I'm it, it's not a intense discussion that I think we need to have at this point. No, sure. Cool. I'm noticing a couple of other questions in the chat, but that are more kind of general. So should we perhaps keep on with the remaining sections, and then we'll save kind of more general questions until the end for the final Q and A. Sure, we can do that. Okay, um, so for the next section, I'm going to go through very quickly a series of visualizations that are quite common and talk about how to recognize them and how to fix them when you see them, whether it's in your own paper or a paper that a colleague is writing or perhaps a paper that you are reviewing. Okay, first one, um, recommended practices to use semi-transparency or gradients to make all data points visible. This tends to show up in three different types of plots. Um, sometimes people will use dot plots without jittering where all the points are in a line. This is called a strip plot. The points end up on top of each other and you can't really see every data point. This also shows up a lot in scatter plots and it can show up in smaller sample size scatter plots like the one shown here. Or this is another application for those who work in fields where flow cytometry is common. This is essentially a very, very dense scatter plot um, where there are almost always huge clouds of overlapping data points. And this is just some meta research from data from a study we did looking at peripheral vascular disease journals. So we found that about half of dot plots had problems with not every data point being visible. Um, most scatter plots had this issue, and then about a quarter of flow cytometry plots that we saw in our sample had this issue. So how do we fix it? We'll talk first about the case of the dot plot or strip plot. Um, there are a series of different things you can do, but basically you want to do E. So we'll, we'll go through the options just so you know what they are, but, but also it's just E, so do E. So you can see here lots of overlapping data points, a little bit confusing about what's going on. We can decrease the point size a little bit, but in this data set, it doesn't really get rid of the overlap. We can make our data points semi-transparent. So now areas with more points will show up darker. This is a little helpful, but doesn't fully fix the problem. Jittering is when we add random noise on our um, x-axis in order to spread out the data points. And when the jittering is done randomly, you can still end up with some overlap. So ideally, we want to spread the points out evenly on either side of an imaginary median line that goes down our x-axis um, for the center of our group. And that allows the eye to very quickly outline the shape of these different distributions that we're looking at. It's important to remember that here we can jitter because our x-axis is a group variable, so this is not a measured value. These are just points within the same group, and these numbers, um, it's not a numerical scale, essentially. It's a categorical variable. So symmetric jittering if you have a dot plot or strip plot. <laughs> 
If you have scatter plots, um, you can just make your points semi-transparent if you have a small sample size and relatively little overlap. And then again, your regions with more points will show up darker and your regions with single points will be lighter. If you have a very large sample size, then semi-transparency won't work. You'll end up with saturation too quickly. Um, and so what you wanna do is have a gradient. You could do either a black and white or a color gradient in a colorblind safe color palette, or you could also do uh, scale lines like you might see on a map for showing elevation would be another approach that you could use. Okay. Second common mistake, rainbow color maps. We have all seen stuff that looks like this. Um, you've seen them in scientific papers, you've seen them in, in newspapers and online. Certainly lots of places like to use rainbow color maps. They're colorful, they're pretty, people like them. Unfortunately, they are not great for a couple of reasons. First reason is that they're not colorblind safe. And second reason is that even for those of us with normal color vision, they are not perceptually uniform. And so we want to use alternative color maps like Viridis or Cividis that are colorblind safe and perceptually uniform. So let me just show quickly what I mean by this. This is a picture of the Mona Lisa, as you might normally expect to see it, using a jet color map or rainbow color map and using a colorblind safe and perceptually uniform Viridis color map. And so what we can see here is that if we look at the jet color map, we think that there's something really crazy going on, that there must be a big effect around the region of her chest and her face. The reason that we think this is because our eyes respond much, much more strongly to the reds and the oranges than they do to the blues and greens, and this is not a linear effect. And so that means that this rainbow color map, because of the way our eyes perceive the different colors, is artificially exaggerating the contrast that we see and creating visual artifacts, causing us to believe that there are strong effects in places where they really aren't. So if I look at the same thing in a perceptually uniform color map, I can see that those same regions are a little bit brighter, but not nearly to the extent that the rainbow color map suggests. And this means that we interpret the data correctly. So, if you're using rainbow color maps, get rid of them. Go for something that is colorblind safe and perceptually uniform instead. While we're on the topic of colorblindness, let's talk a little bit more about how to choose colorblind accessible colors. So the most common form of colorblindness affects up to 8% of men and half a percent of women of North European ancestry. And if you think about all the people who will see your manuscript, from your co-authors to reviewers or editors, it's likely that at least one of those people is going to be colorblind. By the time your manuscript is published and it starts being shared with readers, definitely some of those people will be colorblind. And if your, your figures aren't designed in a way that they can interpret and understand, then they are missing out on understanding your data, which is not good for making everything accessible to a broad audience. So you might be thinking, okay, but I'm not colorblindness, or maybe I, or I'm not colorblind, or maybe I am colorblind, but I only have one kind of colorblindness, and there are three. Um, how can I tell whether my figure is colorblind accessible? There are lots of free tools that you can use to change your screen in order to get a sense of what a person with different forms of colorblindness would see. The tool that I use is called Color Oracle. You can download it probably in the time that it takes me to present this slide. It is free, it is very easy to use. It will show up as a little color wheel in your screen and you just click that color wheel and then it will give you a choice of different kinds of color blindness and it will tell you how common each of those are. And as soon as you click on one of those, it will just change all the colors on your screen to simulate what a person with that type of color blindness might see if they were looking at your figure. So this allows you to very quickly get a sense of whether features would be visible to someone who is colorblind or not when they're examining your figures. Every person is different, so these simulators aren't 100% accurate, but they are still better than you know, not having any idea and not thinking about colorblindness at all. This just gives you an example. Here's a normal picture of a little lizard thing on a plant. And you can see that if I happen to have the most common form of colorblindness, deuteranopia, um, the lizard and the plant would be the same color for me and they would be hard to distinguish. Whereas if I have the least common form of colorblindness, tritinopia, it would be easier for me to see the difference between these two things. 
So we'll use microscopy as an example here um, because it's a very common one. So here are some color combinations that we might see. Green and red is a favorite color combination in microscopy, um, does not work at all for people with the most common form of color blindness. Green and blue is sometimes used as well. This works okay for people with the most common form of color blindness, but does not work well for people with the least common form of color blindness. In contrast, if I look at cyan and magenta, this is a colorblind accessible combination. All three types of, or all both normal color vision as well as both forms of color blindness would be able to interpret this figure. Um, microscopists work a lot with green fluorescent protein, and so sometimes they like to, instead of you know changing one of the colors, leave the green as it is and use green and magenta. This also works reasonably well for both forms of color blindness. Okay, next thing, include a flowchart to help readers understand your study design and assess the risk of bias. Many of you have probably seen flowcharts before, especially if you work with human studies or if you work with systematic reviews, you can do them for animal studies and in vitro research, but they're less common. Essentially, you're gonna end up with something like this. So this is simply a chart that provides you with an overview of the study design, the groups, the phases at which randomization occurred. Um, and it also outlines the number of observations that were excluded versus included at each phase and the reasons why those observations were excluded. And those reasons, as well as the shape of the slow diagram and how it looks will change depending on your exact study and experimental design. One of the reasons that flowcharts are so important is they provide a very complete overview of included and excluded observations and reason for exclusion. And this is especially important because if we exclude observations in a biased way, it dramatically increases the likelihood that we will get false positive findings. And this is especially true for small studies. Um, so I've shown here a link to a paper that does some modeling to show this. That paper also has some meta-research data where they looked at preclinical studies of cancer and stroke, and they found that seven to eight percent of studies included observations without or excluded, sorry that should say excluded not included, um, seven to eight percent of ex studies excluded observations without explaining why, and they also found that in two thirds of papers, they didn't have the information needed to determine whether any observations were excluded. And so this is a major problem because it means that we are effectively unable to evaluate this element of the risk of bias in a lot of studies. Flowcharts, again, very detailed information about attrition and they are an excellent solution to this problem. Unfortunately, flowcharts aren't used very much. This is data from a preprint that we posted last week. Um, and here you can see across 23 fields over the years of 2010 to 2020, what percentage of papers had flowcharts. Uh, most fields, the maximum values we're seeing in 2020 are around 25%. In a lot of fields, flowcharts really aren't being used at all, and it's less than 5 to 10%. So this is really a missed opportunity in terms of reproducibility. Um, I could spend a whole session on how to make flowcharts. We don't have time for that today. But generally speaking, if you've never done one before, then one place that I would recommend starting is to start by Googling flowcharts for your study design and type using Google Images, get a sense of how they work, what information people are showing. Um, some flowcharts are a lot better than others. And once you find a structure that's relatively close to what you're looking for, you can modify it to fit your study. If you happen to be working with systematic reviews or randomized controlled trials, then the reporting guidelines for those particular study types already have templates for how to make flowcharts in them. If you are working with animal studies, then the NC3Rs offers a free online tool called the Experimental Design Assistant, and it will help you design and set up your study in a reproducible way, and it will also create a flowchart for you and help you to track exclusion and reasons for exclusions at each phase of your study. Next tip, avoid pie charts. Okay. So a little bit of an exercise here. Um, I have a pie chart and I'm going to ask you to rank the sections from smallest to largest. And you can just note your answers on a piece of paper next to you if anyone has paper. 
or uh, you can write them out in the chat if you would like as well. So I'll just give everyone a little bit of time to evaluate this pie chart. Okay, do people have an answer? All right, how'd you do? And the follow up question, how long would it take you to do this with the bar graph compared to the pie chart if you wanted to compare sizes of the areas? So the challenging thing about pie charts is that they require us to make decisions about the size of different slices based on areas um, and angles. And these aren't things that our brains do particularly well. Comparing lengths is a lot easier for us than comparing areas and angles. And so pie charts are particularly problematic when you have a lot of slices or when you have slices in sim that are similar in size, it can be quite difficult for people to correctly assess um, the relative size of different slices of the pie. So um, there are a couple of exceptions to this rule. So our eyes are actually fairly good at evaluating proportions that are close to 25, 50, 75, or 100%. So if you have a small number of slices and your proportions are close to these numbers, then you may do okay with the pie chart. Um, I also have students who like to mess with me and send me these things. So there are two other cases that they have identified where one can use a pie chart, and that is to show the relative size of the sunny versus the shady size of, side of the pyramid, as well as the proportion of pie you have eaten. In both of these cases, a pie chart seems to work quite well. Okay, last thing, um, avoid 3D graphs for 2D data. Many of you probably know this. It's not a particularly common problem, but it is one that you see from time to time. So here we have some 2D data. Um, we are simply comparing four different groups and the proportion for each group. Um, however, the authors have chosen to add a third dimension that doesn't need to be there to their graph. This makes the graph hard to interpret. Um, people don't know whether they're supposed to interpret from the back of the graph or from the front of the graph. It's hard to follow around the corner and estimate the value here. And it also makes it more difficult to compare the relative heights of the bar. Are you going again from the front or the back? There's a lot of visual interference. It's hard to see. So the extra dimension isn't adding information. It does make the graph difficult to read. Avoid this. Very simple. Okay, um, last section is on image-based figures. Are there questions or comments on this section? I don't seem to have been. I just thought because it's coming up to the hour and some people might have to drop off, but there were some really good questions before. Maybe if we just quickly ask them. Sure. Um, so the first, Nora asked whether the slides will be available. And I just wanted to point out to anyone, um, everyone that the slides will be on the Riot Central OSF page. And also the, a copy of this recording will go up on YouTube. So you can listen back and take in just the tremendous amount of good points and tips. Um, so then a question for Tracy. Alison asked where you deposit your visuals. Um, there are a variety of options. I don't think it matters um, so much. I generally use OSF for mine because we're often depositing visuals along with study protocols and data sets and code. And OSF is a little bit more friendly to having multiple types of things deposited. Um, Figshare is another repository that people like. One, and it's, it's particularly conducive for images. Um, one other thing that you should check when you're picking repositories is to look for one that's backed up by something called clocks. Clocks is a service that basically, if your repository ceases to exist, it will preserve the latest version of that repository forever and ever, as long as there is an internet. And so that is really helpful because repositories do disappear from time to time. Um, so making sure that you have a repository that's backed by clocks and will continue to be accessible if that repository ceases to exist is quite important. 
Nice. And one more question earlier from Charlotte. She asked, which well, said, fantastic, uh, Cliff, talk. Thank you very much, Tracy. What are your favorite software programs for editing figures? Um, I mean, there are two answers to this. If you are the type of person that knows how to code and for whom making everything fully reproducible is a priority, then using something like R um, where you can use ggplot in order to make, you know, have the code and the data and the figure all available together is really helpful for reproducibility. In terms of the figure itself, um, the answer beyond that reproducibility component, the answer that I usually give is the software doesn't matter so much. What matters is that you know what makes a good usual visualization and how to create one. Once you have identified that and you know what your visualization needs in order to be clear and easy to understand, then you can figure out how to do that using whatever program you're comfortable with. And if you can't figure out how to do that, then your program may have some limitations and you may need to switch and explore something else. Um, so when I'm teaching visualization, I, I generally focus on what makes a good figure as opposed to how to write the code to make a good figure. Um, so yeah, it's as long as you can make a good visualization in it, you can use what you like. Um, just make sure that the visualization is good is the most important thing for me. Nice. And then one last question that's come in recently um, from Erica. She asked about whether there are any tools for colorblind figure designers. Um, Hugo had mentioned then the colororacle.org that you've already brought up. I just wondered if Erica or Tracy have anything else. Is there any more you'd like on that, Erica? Yeah, I think Color Oracle is very helpful for um, just assessing colorblindness if you're not using something else that has a built-in colorblindness checker. What tools people use are often specific to the type of visualization that you're working with. So if you're working with microscopy images, there are programs that people prefer versus if you're you know, coding figures from data versus if you're making infographics. Um, so yeah, I, I almost hesitate to give recommendations because it depends a lot on exactly what type of thing that you're, it is that you're trying to create. Can I actually just follow on from that? And what, what about if, um, Eric followed up with this, but what, what about if, if um, something going the other way? So what if, what if you are colorblind and there's something that's not a good choice for the majority of readers? Even though if you're colorblind, it seems clear to you, is that can that ever be the um, the case? Um, it's I've had a lot of <laughs> colorblind people who who don't. I think when I talk to colorblind people, they seem to be used to the fact that certain information won't be accessible to them. Um, like I've had an off a, a person who was telling me that the journal they submitted a particular version of the graph and the journal changed the colors in it so that they were no longer visible to him. Um, and he asked the journal and said, you know, I, can, I can't see the difference anymore. And the journal said, oh yeah, we just changed the colors to correspond to our you know, journal color theme. And he, he didn't go back and say, I can't see that. And I'm the author and I really want to be able to see my, you know, my own figure. Um, <laughs> let's fix this. So I, I think it's, it would be really helpful if we all thought a lot more about how to make our images colorblind accessible. It's not particularly complicated most of the time. There are certainly very easy things that you can do. It's just a matter of being aware. And once you start using a tool like Color Oracle, you'll very quickly get a sense of what combinations work and what combinations you need to avoid. Or if you're working with larger color maps, you know which ones work well. Um, it's just a matter of changing our defaults, basically. And it would be really nice if equipment makers did the same thing. Like a lot of the clinical imaging software is built around rainbow color maps. They could just change it. That's really something that they could just do. <laughs> like if you're looking at Doppler flow, it doesn't need to be in a rainbow. It can be in a colorblind safe color map. They could change that tomorrow if they wanted to. <laughs> 
Nice. Thank you, Tracy, and everyone for your questions as well. Should we crack on with the third part? Okay, um, so the third part will be most relevant to those of you who are making image-based figures. And if there are those of you who don't work with image-based figures at all and think this is not relevant to my life and you would like to go to something else now, that is completely fine. Please feel free to do that. Um, I don't want to keep anyone hostage or kidnapped in this session if it's not going to be useful to you. So the information that I'm going to be talking about today comes from this paper. This is a meta research study that was done as part of the eLife Ambassadors program by a group of 19 early career researchers from around the world um, who had not heard of meta research when they joined the Ambassadors meta research team and they learned about meta research by working together to design, conduct and publish a meta research study. So there is data in that paper about how common many of the practices that I will show today are across three different fields, plant sciences, physiology, and cell biology. Um, and there are also slides, data, and code for this study available on the Open Science Framework repository for the study. So for those of you who have an interest in getting more information about this work or a paper that you can cite in peer reviews, I would encourage people to check out the full paper. There are seven steps for preparing image-based figures. A couple of them we have already talked about, so I will skip over them fairly quickly. But just so you have an overview of what those seven are, the first thing is to choose a magnification and scale that fits your research question. The second is to add a clearly labeled scale bar. The third is to use colored wisely. Fourth is choosing a colorblind accessible color palette, and we've talked quite a bit about how to do this already. Um, fifth is designing your figure, and here again we've talked about how to identify your objectives and set up your panels using a figure planning table and a layout diagram. Sixth is to annotate the figure, and seventh is prepare legends. And again, the paper does walk you through all of these steps as well. So step one, choosing a magnification and scale that fits your research question. Um, the principle here is simple. Different magnifications or different scales allow you to see different features. And your research question determines what features people need to be able to see in order to answer that research question. And so maybe my research question is about ovary tissue in Drosophila. In that case, I would want this larger tissue scale. Maybe my question is on a cellular level, um, so where are mRNA and, a and DNA located within the oocyte? In that case, I might use the smaller cellular scale. And then I might also have questions that relate to a subcellular scale, like questions about the RNA granules within the epithelial cell um, of the drosophilia ovary or oocyte. So, Whatever your research question is, you need to make sure that your scale is appropriate so that readers can see the features that they need in order to answer the research question. Sometimes a single scale isn't sufficient and readers need more than one scale. In this case, we use insets. And so when we use insets, we need to do two things. We want to make sure that they are very clearly marked. So I can tell that this here is a Re is the region that is being shown on a larger scale in my inset. And I can clearly see that this inset that's blown up comes from this image and it's exactly positioned right here. And then I can see the same thing for the one below, clearly marked, clearly explained, and I actually have visual features that I can identify to confirm that these two things are the same and that this inset actually comes from this location on the image. We saw a number of examples of problematic practices and insets were actually, most papers that are using insets um, have problems with clearly labeling and annotating them so that others can interpret them. So here's some examples of problems that we saw. The first is a wrongly placed inset. So the region here doesn't appear to have any cells in it, the one that's marked, but we clearly see cells um, in the inset. And so this does not appear to be where the inset was actually taken from. In the second one, we have no inset marked and the inset is obstructing the data. And the same is true for this other image below. We can't really tell if this inset came from this image or where it came from, or if it's just a blown up version from some other images. 
And then in the third one, we have um, two things that are clearly at a different scale, but the origin of the inset in the larger scale image is not marked. The next thing is adding a clearly labeled scale bar. And again, there were lots of papers that were missing scale bars, even though this is something that most of us probably So what do we need to know about scale bars? Well, many of you already know this, but I'll just run through it quickly as a, as a quick overview. Scale bars are important because they can play essential information about the size of an object. And this is quite important. So for example, if your mice are 25% larger than someone else's mice, or if your plants are 25% larger than someone else's plants, this is a potentially important difference in phenotype that could have an impact on your results. And others need to be able to see that information. So every image needs a scale bar. Um, microscopists are a little bit better at using scale bars. Photographs are very often missing scale bars. Scale bars and the labels of the size of those scale bars should be clearly labeled. And you also want to annotate your scale bar with dimensions on the image. So a lot of people will actually put their dimensions in the legend. And this takes a lot of time for readers to go back and forth between the image and the legend to try to figure out exactly where the dimensions for you know, panel G in a panel in a figure with N panels are. Um, and sometimes for really large figures, the legend ends up being on a completely separate page. So you're flipping back and forth between pages in order to figure out what the dimension is. Make everyone's life easy. Just put the scale bar dimensions on the scale bar on the image itself and everyone's life will be better. Here are some common problems that we saw when we were looking at papers that did have scale bars. So there's obviously the no scale bar problem. Um, here we have some compression issues where the scale bar actually becomes illegible. So I can see that it's there, but I can't read the dimension or tell how big it is, even if I zoom in. Here we have a gray image and a gray scale bar, which is really hard to see, kind of blends in, don't know what's going on here. Here we have a colored scale bar that again is bending in with the background color of the image. Um, this, there's a really tiny scale bar somewhere, but it blends into the background and I can't see it. And here we have another one where we have a purple and black image and our scale bar and label just seems to be blending in. It is visible, it's there, but I have to look pretty hard for it. So how do we fix these things? Easily. Um, nice thick scale bar in a color that's high contrast with the background and stands out. Maybe you have a multicolor background, lots of grays and blacks. Here you can put a semi-transparent box and then put your scale bar in black so that the scale bar marking really stands out. You can have your ruler as a scale bar and you can label your size either directly below the image or on the image itself, depending on what you prefer. Um, and then these are just examples of more of the same. Another, if you don't want to do the box on top of your image and you want to leave your image free, you can move your scale bar below the image and then put the label on the white background so that these things clearly stand out. So these are some options for solutions if you have a scale bar that's not showing up for how to make it more visible and easier for your readers to find and interpret. Use color widely. So we talked about in the first section how the use of color is very, very important. If you use it effectively, then it enhances readers' understanding, but if you use it badly, then it can be very distracting or misleading for readers. So let's talk about images specifically and when you should use color. The first thing you might see is a photograph. And in this case, we have a color photo and it's meant to show the appearance of something as it actually is. In this case, you want to use color because the image was in color. Um, you may be able to switch to black and white if all features of the image that you want to show happen to be clearly visible in black and white. But again, color is helpful when it's showing the actual appearance of an object in a photograph. If you have a single color microscope image, then sometimes grayscale can be helpful because it has a higher contrast and can be a little bit easier to see. Although you can minimize this, this problem if you make smart choices about which colors you use. And we'll talk about which ones have higher contrast versus lower contrast. When you have microscope images with two or three colors, um, it becomes a little bit more complicated. And I will talk in a couple of slides about options for using two or three color microscope images 
and having strategies to make those images colorblind accessible. And then the last one is your mic electron microscopy images. These are grayscale by default, and so you would continue to use grayscale for them. Okay, visibility of color depends on the background. And so we have here a series of colors, and for every block here, there's another block that shows you a grayscale test for visibility. Um, the combinations on top have the highest contrast and are best for visibility. The combinations on the bottom are not good for visibility. They have low contrast. You're losing information. They should be avoided. So black and white, blue on white, and white on black all work very well. High contrast, um, excellent choices. Yellow on black, cyan on black, and green on black also work reasonably well. There's minimal loss of information here. When you start to get to the darker colors like magenta and red on black, we begin to see a clear loss of information and some problems. And blue on black, there's clearly quite a bit of loss of information. So this is a color combination that you definitely want to avoid. Choose colorblind accessible colors. Um, we talked about this earlier. So I'm just going to go over the examples for two and three color microscopy. Generally speaking, the options toward the bottom are better than the options towards the top. So here we have two images, and then here we have three or two colors, two channel versus three channel. Um, in terms of solutions, your first option is to simply use a colorblind safe combination. So replacing our red green with a cyan and magenta, for example. This works well for two colors. When you have three colors, there isn't really a good set of combinations that's colorblind accessible in microscopy with three colors. One option is to do um, divide into a two color image and then a third image, but then that third image here is blue on black, which we know it's not great. The other option is to combine two hues with a grayscale image. Depending on the image, it may or may not be as effective. I would say in this, because there's so much overlap between the three colors, it is not effective here. So not a great option for three channel microscopy. Your next option is to simply split your channels so that people can view them separately. Um, and this makes it easier for people to kind of compare where the different colors are located. Again, with the three colors here, we do end up with a blue on black, which is not great. The other option, and you could show a merge channel next to these as well. The other option is to put your channels in grayscale and split them, or to split your channels and show them in inverted grayscale as well. And then again, you could show a merge next to this if you wanted but it still allows with a separate channel, someone who's colorblind can compare visually, even if the combination isn't a good one for them to see. Okay, designing your figure, um, we have already talked about this. So define your objective of your figure, use a planning table to set up all of your panels and then organize your panels using a figure layout sketch. Annotating your figure. Annotations can help with making microscopy and other types of image-based figures accessible to a broad audience. There are a number of features you might want to annotate. The first one is size, and for this we use a scale bar with dimensions, and we've talked about how to do that. If you want to show the direction of movement, we usually use an arrow with a tail. There are also a number of features that you might want to draw attention to. So if you're looking at points of interest, then you might use a symbol like an arrowhead or a star. If you have an entire region of interest on a black and white image, then you could highlight that region in color or outline it with a square or a circle. If you have the region of interest on a colored image, then you can outline with box or circles. And if you have layers, then there are two options. You can either put labeled brackets beside the image, or you can use wavy lines to differentiate the images or the layers on the image. Um, and then lastly, if you want to define a feature that's shown in an image, you should use a label. Here are a variety of options for ways that you might label an image. The first one is with arrows that point to different features. Um, this is okay when you have a small number of features. You want to avoid having arrows that cross. It can also be problematic if you are using arrows to show movement and then arrows to show location within the same figure. So I don't recommend combining those two things. 
In terms of region of interest, you can simply outline where that region happens to be using dotted lines or boxes or circles around the feature that you're interested in. Um, you wanna do this carefully to avoid obstructing the features. And if you're using dashed lines, you wanna make sure that they're thick enough to be visible at the size at which the image will ultimately be published. You can also simply use lines to connect a feature to its label and place the labels outside of the image. This gives you, avoids the problem of having labels that are on top of the image itself and interfering with the, um, with reader's ability to see the image. And then if you want to mark the location of every item or every, every time something appears, then you could potentially use a letter code to do this. So a, each A shows the location of a nurse cell, for example. Okay, choosing the right amount of labeling. Um, we've talked about this already, so I'm just going to skip over this part. Explaining your colors or your stains that you're using. So there are a number of problematic practices we saw. The first one was not explaining what the colors meant at all. Um, and another variation of this was pretty common was people would explain the colors that were indicating unique markers, but they wouldn't explain the control. So for example, if DAPI was shown in blue, then that of it, that wouldn't be stated. They would just state you know, what the other parts represented. The second is the annotation is in the colors, which would normally be good, except that the colors aren't colorblind safe. And so this wouldn't be accessible. Here we have an annotation that is very small and hard to read, and it's also incomplete. It only addresses one color and not the other. And then here we have an annotation that is actually covering up part of our image, which is a problem. How do we fix this? Um, if you are using the colors themselves in your annotation, then make sure that you have a colorblind safe color combination. You can also put your labels in the colors, but above the separate channels so that it's clear that this color aligns with this image and this color aligns with this image. And finally, you can simply note the colors above and name them in grayscale. The last thing is annotations and making sure that those themselves are colorblind safe. So this was a really common problem we saw, for example, in plant sciences, plants are generally green. A lot of plant scientists like to put red arrows on things, not useful to someone who's colorblind. So here are some examples. In the first case, we have colored annotation that's not in colorblind safe colors. So all of these things look the same and a colorblind reader would not be able to interpret them. Here we have colors that were selected to be colorblind safe, so it's easier to distinguish between the different types of annotation. And here we have grayscale annotation in black and white. So again, a colorblind reader as well as a normal color vision reader could easily interpret them. Lastly, prepare your figure legends. Um, requirements here really depend on the journal. That's gonna place some constraints. So we recommend including information about the species and tissue or the object shown in your image, including clear explanations of all of your labels and annotations, as well as all of your colors and stains. However, again, what you're going to be able to do will depend on the journal instructions and requirements. Okay, um, so this is just a summary of all of the points that we have discussed today, but I think in the interest of time, we'll maybe just go straight to questions. Thank you so much, Tracy. That was absolutely brilliant. We have had one question in the section in the chat from Alison, who has asked, um, so she said, scale bars and image reproduction generally, I find journals are not that helpful um, and have rigid instructions and do not want to engage. So do you have any tips for kind of inflexible journals? Um. I negotiate a lot. Sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not. Um, <laughs> I think it's it's a little bit easier for us because we publish a lot of papers on visualizations, which means it's easier for us to say, hey, I need 13 visualizations because you know this is a paper about data visualization. Um, I've also, for example, had journals that we've published in that don't offer a text box format, and we like to use text boxes, so I've been able to convince some journals that they do need to offer a text box, for, text box format and to make one for us. Um, you do what you can. Sometimes you will be successful, sometimes you won't, um, but I think 
you will never know if you don't ask and practices won't get better if all of us are not collectively asking. So if you see something that's not ideal or not optimal, try to engage the editor in a conversation um, and see if you can get you know, an adjustment made, um, ideally not just for your paper, but something that will be useful for everyone. Nice, and another question's coming from Anna, um, who's asked, what color background would you recommend when photographing white objects? Um, I would go for something higher contrast. So I would look for a color background. I mean, I think the nice thing about visualization when you're photographing is you can experiment, you can try things and see what works well um, and what makes the features easy to see. But I would be looking for a darker background when you're photographing a white object. Nice, and Hugo's got his hand up. Yeah, there's so many thank yous in the chat. And also I just wanna say, yeah, thanks for me. It's been fantastic. Um, one of the things that I was thinking was at the start of the talk, you made um, the really important point that authors will choose visualizations based on what they want to highlight. Um, and we reckon, you know, generally for analyses, we wouldn't want authors to select that sort of after their study. We'd, we'd expect, you know, we'd hope that they would pre-specify um, their analyses and the outcomes they're analyzing. Do you think that the choice of visualization should ever be included in pre-specifications or is that kind of excessively prescriptive and just sort of going overboard on the, on the trying to plan everything before you start? Um, so I think it, it depends here. Infographics are different from data visualizations, which I think is more what you are referring to. Um, I'm not, I, so usually you should have a sense before you collect your data of what your visualization is going to look like in terms of what type of graph you would use for this type of data. Um, and you should be able to outline those things. The, the changes that you might make are going to be things around the labeling or you know which groups do I show next to each other or what color scheme am I using? Some of that you can very specify, some of that may not be as easy to pre-specify. Um, so I think a lot of like the basic, what type of graph do I plan to use? Often that can be pre-specified, especially your work, if you're working with a data type that you are familiar with and that is you know, commonly used in your research group. Um, I think some of the other things around accessibility and interpretability, those may need to be adjusted afterwards and they are more you know, annotations and features in the image and colors and things like that that are probably not so important to pre-specify. Yeah, yeah, I that think that's right. And, and I also, I mean, I think visualization at some level, you just have to try stuff and see what works. Um, there's always a level where you can have it all planned out in your head and you, you graph it and you're just like, mm, no, that's not <laughs> what I thought it was going to be. Um, so I think you have to be prepared for that as well, especially if it's a new type of data or you know, if you were maybe doing some exploratory analyses that you didn't plan ahead, then, you know, just be honest, it's an exploratory analysis. We didn't plan this part. Thanks, Lucia. Yeah. Any help, Lance? Well, yeah, so we've had loads of thank yous in the chat. Um, massive thank you from me, Tracy. I've made about a page of densely packed notes full of loads of things to think about in the future. Um, as I'm sure a lot of people here have. So um, yeah, um, a huge thank you to you from all of us and also to everyone who's come along. Um, it's, yeah, it's been really nice. And I believe the next talk in the Bristol Riots calendar will be coming up in May. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, yeah, and to, to in the chat, yeah, the, the slides will be available. There's um, central, Riot Science Club OSF page and all the slides from the talks or all the slides that we can share from the talks get uploaded there. We also have the YouTube account where all the talks get up or most of the talks get uploaded. Um, so yeah, for updates about future talks, not just from Riots Bristol, um, but also to for all the Riot Science Club, follow us on Twitter. Um, 
Yes, and I will also, um, if I get time later tonight or tomorrow, I will try to post a list of links to resources that I mentioned during the talk as well on my Twitter account. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just posting the link in the chat. I believe should um, let me know if you can't access the slides in there. Um, yeah, that's been wonderful. Cool. Thanks very much. I'll stop the recording.